The next article of the Lutheran Confessions, Article 27 on monastic vows. All right, first of all, what are monastic vows? Uh, monastic vows are promises made to God by men and women who believe they're conforming their lives to Christ's life by these vows. Now, here is a, here's a prime example of good intentions not always leading in good places. Uh, those who take monastic vows, nuns and monks, have the best of intentions. They want to live like Christ. They want to conform their lives to the lives of Christ. And yet you can't fault anybody for that sort of intention. Uh, the question is, really, do they understand what the life of Christ really is? Uh, is, is what they are mirroring really the life of Christ? And that becomes the issue. A typical monastic vows. Celibacy. Uh, virtually all monastic vows have vows to celibacy, to remain single and unmarried uh, throughout life. Uh, was that consistent with Jesus? Okay, yes, it was. Is there a difference between Jesus' life of celibacy and a monastic life of celibacy? I, I think there is. Jesus was not doing this as a higher form of spirituality. Jesus simply chose not to marry, knowing full well the cross he was going to have to bear and the pain he was going to have to endure and not to drag a wife along into something like that. There's nothing wrong with marrying. It is not a higher form of spirituality to not marry. Uh, and it also was never in Christ's life suggested that in order to emulate him, one had to stay single and not marry. Never is there a word of, about this in Scripture. Two, virtually all of the disciples were married. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, that's conveniently ignored. That, yeah, that was fine for them, but... Um, I guess, I guess we're holier than them. I don't know. I don't know the justification for it. Now, poverty. Now, the renunciation of private ownership of goods. Again, is that consistent with Christ? Well, outwardly, yes. Uh, but again, Jesus' poverty was to identify with the common people, not set himself up as like extra poor. It wasn't that he renounced all private property or private ownership. He just chose to be a traveling preacher and he owned nothing. He was one of the people. He was just like them. That was the point of the incarnation, was to be fully human and fully like everybody around them. This sort of poverty is to make oneself unlike the rest of the world, to, to set yourself, again, at a, at a level worse than the, than the humanity around you. Uh, some of the monastic vow poverty is taken to such an extreme that even for food, they have to beg for food. And they, they literally become beggars in the community, going around with their little bowls looking for things, to people to put things in their bowls. Again, that wasn't Christ's life. Simplicity. You know, living simply. That's, again, nothing wrong with that per se. Yes, Jesus lived simply. Uh, but this is a, a level of simplicity the world does not practice. Four, stability, to remain a monk or nun until death. These are lifelong vows that a monk or a nun will take. Uh, obedience. Obedience not necessarily to God, but to the, to the abbot or the whatever you call the nun counterpart of that, uh, to, the, to the head of the nunnery or monastery. You swear obedience to them, that you will obey whatever they tell you. Uh, those are pretty much typical of all vows of all monks and all nuns, that there's a, a common body of vows, and that's all part of it. Non-typical monastic vows, that is, vows that occur sometimes among some orders of monks and nuns, but not others, would be a vow of silence. 
never, never to speak. In fact, a bit of, there was a bit of a controversy not that long ago over an order of nuns that had taken a vow of silence, but they were given a special permission uh, to break their vow of silence when the Pope went by, and then they could shout his praises. Uh, this is seen, again, as, a, as, a, as a, an act of personal self-denial, as an act of devotion. But if, you're, if your goal is to conform to Christ's life, Christ was anything but silent. Uh, in fact, it was his speaking to the world around him that got him in the trouble he was in. Uh, so that is, that is not Christ-like, but it is a vow. Two, isolation, hermits. Uh, there are some groups of monks especially, more so monks than nuns. In fact, I don't know of any orders of nuns that are hermits. There are several orders of monks that are hermits, though. Uh, and a hermit monk will literally go up on a mountainside, have a little hut by himself, and he will be there alone, not have any human contact with another human being, maybe a couple of times a year, and that's it. And supposedly during this time of isolation, he devotes himself completely to prayer and, and reading the Bible and worship. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi is one who is often looked at as a hermit. Uh, and there's an order of Franciscan monks. Actually, there's an order of Carmelite monks that are hermits. Uh, there are several levels of monks within that one order, the Carmelites. Uh, you've, you've got your social monks who go out in the community and do social work. Uh, you've got your liturgical monks who stay in the church and do liturgy all day long. And you've got your hermits who live up by themselves. And the hermit is considered the highest level of monk. Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah, you'll often see pictures of St. Francis with his hand kind of up and a bird sitting on his hand. Uh, legend has it that St. Francis of Assisi preached to the animals, that that was his calling, to take the gospel to the animals. And supposedly, he, uh, he heard God speaking to him and saw visions and this sort of thing. He was very mystical in that way. Now, for my money, when I read the description of what St. Francis was like, to me, he sounds like a schizophrenic. Seriously. He heard voices and saw visions and preached to animals and lived by himself out in the woods. If that's not schizophrenic, I don't know what is. Uh, but he's revered as a, as a uh, model of devotion to Christ. In, uh, at school, Melody, when she was there, the band director at the time was Roman Catholic. And I don't know if, how, why, but for some reason, Melody and I had talked about St. Francis, and the, the band director brought him up, and Melody said something about, yeah, St. Francis is probably schizophrenic. The band director did not appreciate that. <laughs> he got all offended. That was a major insult to his faith. Um, Nazar Nazarite vows. Well, at least he wasn't claiming to be Christ-like. Um, Samson was morally a horrendous individual in a lot of, a lot of ways, uh, despite the fact that he was a judge. But yeah, what about the Nazarite vows? There were very few of them, and they, were, they tend to be associated more with the office of prophet. Uh, didn't didn't uh, cut their hair, lived simply, supposedly wouldn't drink strong drink, any, any fermented drink, although Samson did regularly. Uh, he was a very bad vow keeper. Samson broke almost. Weren't supposed to come in contact with a dead body. Samson did that all the time, too. Uh, so he, he was breaking his vows constantly. So were the Nazarite vows um, You know, there's, there's nothing specifically biblically commanded to do them. Uh, they were an act of devotion. They're never held up biblically as being a model for what being faithful is. Was it wrong? Um, I, don't, I wouldn't go as far as to say that a Nazarite's vows were wrong. Um, but they certainly were a very rare and unique thing that only certain people were ever supposed to do. 
John the Baptist really was a Nazarite in the way he carried himself. But again, he never even makes an issue out of the fact that he's a Nazarite. So, yeah, they were vows of self-depreciation, vows of, uh, uh, of, of denying oneself, and that's not necessarily wrong. It only becomes wrong when one sees this as a higher level of spirituality above everybody else's and really as a means to merit something from God. And that's, that's the big thing with the monks. It's not the fact that they're taking vows to deny themselves. It's that they believe by denying themselves like this, they're placing themselves at a higher level of spirituality and they are earning something from God. That's the real issue. So yes, they did take vows. Yes, they're similar to, to, to monastic vows. But no, they aren't the same thing because they weren't meriting grace by doing it. Anything else? All right. Uh, here's, here's a couple of citations before we actually look at what the confessions say, just so you know what they say of themselves, so that this isn't coming from my analysis of them, but from their own mouths. Here are a couple of citations. And what's, you know, also, it's, it's kind of like the Amish in a way, where they swear off electricity, and yet they can have it in their milk houses, and they can you know, ride in cars. They just can't own one. They, all these little exceptions to the rule. Here's these monks with vows of poverty and simplicity and all that, and they all have web pages, every one of them. So anyway, here's a web page from Trappist Monks. Each of us takes a vow of conversion by which we promise to live the monastic way of life as a means of learning the truth about ourselves. Knowing ourselves as we really are, we become radically dependent on the Lord Jesus who shows us God's mercy. Confident in God's forgiveness, we experience intimacy with God and are born to a new kind of life. Now, I ask you... Is that what God's word says makes you born into a new kind of life? By isolating yourself and taking these vows of, of self-deprecation. Is that how, you, how scripture says you know yourself and that you rise to a higher intimacy with God? Nowhere. It's not biblical. It's just not biblical. Uh, Orthodox monks. This isn't just a Roman Catholic thing. Uh, Greek Orthodox uh, there's an order of monks known as the monks of St. Columba of Iona. Uh, here is what one monk among them wrote. As I have written before, the monastic life is like a three-legged stool. One of those legs is prayer, the other is divine reading, and the third, and the subject of this essay, is work. Monastic work is very different from the work we might perform in the secular world as its focus is not on us but on the other. Our work is an expression of our love, not the love of work or the love of money, but the love of the community and of the other. Self-forgetful service to the community is a movement out of me and a movement toward the other. It is a movement of giving and a movement of love. Our work loses the intent to serve, uh, oh no, excuse me, if our work loses the intent to serve the other, then it becomes merely a means of support and less a monastic practice. Now, I suggest that reveals a tremendous arrogance. His work is for the other, but your work somehow isn't? When you're out there in the fields doing your job, are you thinking, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to pile this up in my bank account for me? You know, no. You're working for your family. You're working to support everybody around you. You're not out there for yourself. Uh, what arrogance to assume that his work somehow or another is a work for other and therefore it's better than secular work. You know, this is what really drove Luther nuts. And this is, this is the, the genius of Luther's doctrine of vocation, that everybody's work is a holy work to God. It's not just the monks who have, a, have a, the, the market cornered on offering up some kind of work to God. And when we are doing our normal daily work, we are doing it for family. We are doing it for others. We are divesting ourselves of self. Uh, to assume that's not happening in the secular world is utter arrogance. Putting, like putting work uh, as a means of getting to heaven? 
You bet it is. Because his work is holier and above secular work and a divesting of himself for everybody else, then yes, it's, a, it's, it's earning something. It is a merit. It is, it is being done, even though it's in isolation. And this is, you know, again, the irony of it. This guy's work is in utter isolation of everybody around him. And the work he's doing, the work that monks do, support the monastery. That's how they earn money for the monastery. They're not doing this work and giving the money back into the community for other. He says he's supporting others through his work. Who others? The other monks in the monastery, because that's where it goes. The Carmelite monks, if you look up their webpage, they're laughable in a way. They're, they're wearing the typical Martin Luther brown robe, the Carmelites, sandals. They even have the, the bowl haircut thing, that little strip around there. They look just like Luther in the pictures. And then you'll see them in their webpage, standing in front of these multi tens of thousands of dollar coffee roasters. One of the works they do is to get in coffee bean, roast it, and sell the coffee. They claim these vows of poverty and everything, but the, their, their machines they're working on are all state of the art, tens of thousands of dollars machinery. They're not doing this old world way. You know, they're not treading grapes with their feet to make wine and sell. They've got high-quality, state-of-the-art presses doing this stuff. So, yeah, they've taken vows of poverty, all right. They don't have personal ownership, but the monastery is loaded. And that money they're earning is going right back to themselves. They're not doing this for the poor of the community. That's just plain a lie. So, yeah, there's, there's an example of that. The last one, here are the Carmelite monks. In keeping with the Carmelite tradition, the Carmelite monks profess the evangelical counsels by making vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty to God and the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel in the hands of the prior. He's the head of the monastery. Like the monks of the desert and the first hermits on Mount Carmel, the monks of the most blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel have been driven by the ardor of the Holy Spirit to sacrifice their lives for the love of Christ and his church. Through this silent martyrdom of love, now they really think highly of themselves, this silent martyrdom of love, the monks are neither forgotten by nor detached from the mystical body of Christ, but rather they make up its heart. They multiply its spiritual wealth and render its prayer sublime. They help sustain its charity. They participate in its suffering its fatigue, its apostleship, or apostolate, its hopes. They are called to increase its merits. By the very nature of living the vows with perfection, the whole of one's life becomes a constant act of worship and a complete holocaust of love for the salvation of souls. You know, what a load of crap. <laughs> they isolate themselves from the rest of the community. They sit behind multi-thousand dollar machines making money for their little group and for the Catholic Church. They're not out there serving the community. They are not offering themselves for the poor. They're offering themselves for themselves. And, and, and that they're the mystical heart of the church? Yeah. Again, if your life was really Christ-like, you'd be living in the community as one of the community, not isolated on a little hilltop someplace. You'd be helping the poor. You'd be giving everything you had to the poor around you. They're not doing that. Sure it is. You bet it is. Yeah. I don't. I should know that one. Carmel, you know, I should know that. I, it's not coming to mind right now. These guys are in Wyoming. I don't know if there's a, there must be a Mount Carmel in Wyoming. It's not, they're not living in biblical lands. It, yeah, now, Right. There, there's an example of somebody who's actually at least putting into practice what they're saying. This Mother Teresa, who, uh, who lived among the poor and actually helped the poor and gave of herself to the poor. 
Uh, her faith was a shambles, too. After her death, they revealed her diaries, and she was, um, she questioned whether there even was a God, but she was very active in charity work and giving of herself. That, uh, that would give some legitimacy to it all, but that is not the way a lot of these guys are. In fact, the Carmelite monks, there's another picture of one sitting in their their brown robes and stuff on the back of a horse with a cowboy hat on. But it's a brown cowboy hat that matches the brown robe nicely. You know, so these claims of poverty, that uh, poverty, the only thing they don't have are ski boats in the, in the garage. You know, but they are not poor, as long as they stay part of the order. The order is loaded. Now, uh, to the confessions. Well, their belief is, and this is, this is typical of the monastic belief from the very beginning of it, the belief is that by isolating yourself, and again, one of them, yeah, the second paragraph there mentions this, the end of the last, uh, second paragraph to the end of what we just read here of the Carmelites, they are called to increase its merits. That merits thing means that it is, by denying themselves, they are doing a good work of self-sacrifice that goes into the treasury of merits, that, that, big, that big tub of merits in heaven, where once it's heaped up with all these good works, the good works flow out of the tub and get credited to everybody else's account. So their self-denial is actually helping the Christian community because they're doing so much good works they're doing more than any human being could be expected of, so their extra good works are going on the credits of the other people. That's how they think they're serving humanity. It's that treasury of merits thing. All right, to the box. This first paragraph of the Confessions. In discussing monastic vows, it is necessary to begin by considering what opinions have hitherto been held concerning them. What kind, of life as li what kind of life as lived in the monasteries and how many of the daily observances in them were contrary not only to the word of God but also to papal canons. In the days of St. Augustine, monastic life was voluntary. Later, when true discipline and doctrine had become corrupted, monastic vows were invented and the attempt was made to restore discipline by means of these vows as if in a well-conceived prison. In addition to monastic vows, many other requirements were imposed, and such fetters and burdens were laid on many before they had attained an appropriate age. All right, so the, so the first complaints here in the confession are these. Uh, a, that such a life is contrary to God's word and even papal rules. Uh, and, and you can see, nowhere has God commanded Christians to do this. Nowhere. Uh, in fact, the idea of isolating oneself from the community is actually anti-biblical. We as Christians are supposed to live in the world but not be of the world. They, they withdraw themselves from the world like Amish. Two, monastic vows are invented, not biblical, and they are repressive. They even mention the fact it's like prison. Uh, there's, there are several stories of uh, even nuns who one of, their, one of the devotions of one of these nuns was to wall up herself in a room with nothing more than a little hole in the wall. And she lived out her entire life, walled up in that room as if in a prison, with just food handed and drink handed to her through the hole in the wall. That's her only human contact. So when they talk about prison-like, they took that literally in some cases. Three, uh, monastic vows were imposed on people too young to make such decisions. That I don't think happens anymore in Christen, Christendom anyway. Um, but they were, there were monastic vows. At that point in time, it was so poor. People were literally starving. Well, the monasteries had all the food. Well, they were doing the works. They had the nice farms. They had the facilities. So parents, in an effort to save their children from starvation, would take them up to the monastery or the nunnery and leave them there. So... Parents were doing this to save their children from starvation, but these were children who were being brought into these orders. That, again, doesn't happen anymore. Uh, next box. It was claimed that monastic vows were equal to baptism, 
and that by monastic life one could earn forgiveness of sin and justification before God. What is more, they added that monastic life not only earned righteousness and godliness, but also that by means of this life, both the precepts and the counsels included in the gospel were kept. And so monastic vows were praised more highly than baptism. They also claim that more merit could be obtained by monastic life than by all other states of life instituted by God. Whether the office of pastor and preacher, of ruler, prince, lord, or the like, all of whom serve in their appointed calling according to God's word and command without invented spirituality. None of these things can be denied, for they are found in their own books. And, and you saw that in these quotations, especially that one that said that they increased the merits. Uh, they still honestly believe that that life merits God's love more than a normal Christian life, than your lives could. That hasn't changed. So other complaints that monasticism earns God's love and forgiveness for the one doing it and for others. That is, it's meritorious. B, that monasticism fulfills the gospel. That's ultimately what's happening here. Christ is being set aside and replaced with human work. And see that it was a superior service to God than any other vocation. And you definitely can see that in the writings of these monks. They believe their life is superior to your average Christian life. So that hasn't changed. Comments? It's safer, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that, that too is the irony. Christ's, Christ's life was not a safe life. By his being in the middle of humanity, he got killed from it. Uh, a monastic life is a very safe, insulated, well-preserved life where there are no dangers, there's no persecution, there's no cross. The only cross they have is self-imposed but there is no cross from the world. It is, again, anti-Christian in that sense. Absolutely. It is. It is. And, and as we started with, though, their intentions are certainly good intentions going into it, but good intentions don't mean good outcome always. And even though their intent is to be Christ-like, they actually wind up being idolatry-like. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you go crazy? Yeah. Um, solitary confinement is said to be one of the cruelest punishments imaginable by man because you mentally go nuts in solitary. You see things. You hallucinate. Yeah, it's psychologically destructive. And, and a lot of this monastic behavior is self-destructive. You know, does God want us to live in isolation? Is that his will for mankind? Uh, to live in self-punishment? Well, what kind of perverse view of God is that? Yes, that's a big part of it. By removing themselves from the world, then they're not tempted by the world, and they can be purer. That's the thinking. When they die, these are lifelong vows. There's never enough. Right. And yeah, that's the nature of human works. When you have a works-based religion, you never do enough. And you're always doing more till your dying breath. And then it's still not enough. So absolutely right. All right, next box. Although God's command concerning marriage frees and releases many from monastic vows, our teachers offer still more reasons why monastic vows are null and void. And, and before I read on, now understand the, the Lutherans, a lot of these Lutherans are ex-monks or priests. All of the Lutheran pastors at this point in history took vows of celibacy. So part of what the confessions do is offer justification for why it's okay for them to break their vows. 
Because, you know, a holy promise to God you're supposed to keep no matter what. The Lutherans didn't. So this is why they were breaking their vows. So, um, second sentence. For all such service of God that is chosen and instituted by men to obtain righteousness in God's grace without the command and authority of God is opposed to God and the Holy Gospel and contrary to God's command. So Christ himself says in Matthew 15, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. St. Paul also teaches everywhere that one is not to seek for righteousness in the precepts and services invented by men, but that righteousness and godliness in God's sight come from faith and trust when we believe that God receives us into his favor for the sake of Christ, his only Son. It is quite evident that the monks have taught and preached that their invented spiritual life makes satisfaction for sin and obtains God's grace and righteousness. What is this but to diminish the glory and honor of the grace of Christ and deny the righteousness of faith? It follows from this that the customary vows were an improper and false service to God. Therefore, they are not binding. For an ungodly vow made contrary to God's command is null and void. St. Paul says in Galatians 5, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. In the same way, those who would be justified by vows are severed from Christ and have fallen away from God's grace, for they rob Christ who alone justifies of his honor and bestows this honor upon their vows in monastic life. So the reason they found for breaking their vows was simply they are not Christian. They are contrary to Christ and the gospel, therefore we can't be bound by them. And really, the main complaint of the confessions is that monastic vows represent a different gospel. They supplant the true gospel of free grace and forgiveness of sins with human works. Uh, Matthew 15.9, uh, that was quoted by the confessions, we kind of already read it, but it's a, it's a very important verse with this discussion. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, God has not commanded this kind of spirituality plain and simple. It is a doctrine invented by men, not of God. And yet it's held up as the higher form of spiritual life. Monastic vows also demean the Christian life of normal men and women by insisting that one's God-given vocation is inferior to a monk's holy life. You aren't as good as a monk, plain and simple. You don't have the same spiritual love of God that they have. That's the bottom line. So they got to live for you because your life is inadequate. That hasn't changed. Next, any thoughts before we go on? Next box. Many instances are also recorded of men who forsook wife and child and also their civil office to take shelter in a monastery. This, they said, is fleeing from the world and seeking a life more pleasing to God than any other. They were unable to understand that one is to serve God by observing the commandments God has given and not by keeping the commandments invented by men. That's a good and perfect state of life, which God has commanded to support it. On the, on which, yeah, which has God's command to support it. On the other hand, that is a dangerous state of life which does not have God's command behind it. So as with the previous article on foods, the issue underneath the surface here is legalism. People are not content obeying God's rules alone, but feel the need to invent more laws to prove their higher devotion to him. This is the legalism of the Pharisees that Jesus combated. It looks very religious and self-depreciating, but it works against true faith because it stands outside the commands of God. So the last two questions. What, in fact, does constitute an act of faith or service to God? What kind of life pleases God the most? They go together. What constitutes an act of service to God? Coming to church would be one. We have a third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Following the commandments. What, what constitutes service to God? Children, honor your, honor your father and your mother. 
do not, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't covet. Don't bear false witness. That, all of that is the service God has given it. And it's not a big, involved, horrible, self-depreciating, got to humiliate yourself kind of service. It is a self-giving service, though. Every one of the commandments. The one monk talked about divesting himself of himself and living for others. That's what the commandments do. They teach us to live for the other. When you're actually face to face with the other. It's easy to say I'm living for the other when you're isolated away and you're never around any others. It's hard when you're face to face with people who can't stand you and you still have to show love. That's a Christian discipline that no monk has ever achieved. Your spirituality in reality exceeds that of any monk or nun. And Luther said this, too, in his writings. He said that your, your six-year-old child who obeys the voice of her mother does more good works than all the nuns and all the monks put together. All right. Thoughts, comments, questions? On monastic vows. It's interesting that God used the monks in a very certain way. Uh, you know, from within to dispel all this that they had done. Absolutely. And he, and he does that constantly throughout the Bible. Yes, he does. He uses that in the common thing. Yeah, and it's. I think what that is, is exactly what Paul said, my strength is made perfect in weakness, when Paul asked to have his thorn in the flesh removed. God reveals his true nature of mercy and love by choosing instruments who are wholly unworthy and incapable on their own, which is why no pastor should ever get a big head. Because you're, not, you're not put in this office because you've got gifts. You're put here maybe for the exact opposite reason, because you're the person least likely to be a, a mouthpiece of God because your life is more prone to sin and weakness. And yet God, God can use even Balaam's donkey to speak the gospel through. It's his strength that's manifest in the weakness of the instrument. Absolutely. Well, repentance is in and of itself a billboard. It's not sinlessness that becomes the billboard, but forgiveness that becomes the billboard. So, it, not that there's ever a, a reason to get out there and sin a good one so you can be forgiven and show everybody how forgiven you are, but you know, to live a forgiven life, to live conscious of the fact that I am unworthy and God loves me anyway, that's, that's the billboard. <laughs> any other comments or thoughts all right let's close there then merciful father we thank you for the life that you have given us to live a life in your grace and under your forgiveness and we pray that you might help us live it faithfully and bear witness of you to the world around us that others may learn of that same grace and be drawn into it to live with us forever Jesus' name, amen.